I want the children to all be stuck on this airplane. You're looking to skunk on this My little friend. My little friend. Hey, here. See the skunk on this airplane? There are, there are, yeah, exactly. There are four skunks in this museum. Painted ones. If you see a live one, please let me know. Let the guards know. There are four skunks in the museum. I just gave you the first one. Now you have to find the other three. Can you see it? It's right here behind the canopy on this airplane. This airplane was used in the Reno Air Races, and the fellow worked for Lockheed, and he was allowed to use the Lockheed logo, the skunk, because of the skunk works at Lockheed in Palmdale, California. It was not built by Lockheed. So, here so right here, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about the Second World War. Again, if we gather around like this, I'll be here for a few minutes. Very good. Second World War. The late 1930s, the United States knew war was coming. We were trying to stay out of it. But they thought we better build an airplane just in case. So the military was looking for a high altitude twin engine fighter. And the folks at Lockheed, we were just talking about Lockheed, came up with this design. I'm going to show you a picture of one of the assistant design engineers for Lockheed at the time. His name is Clarence Kelly Johnson. His name is going to come up a few more times today with the Wright brothers and, and many, many other famous Americans. One of the most influential airplane designers in American history, Clarence Kelly Johnson. He was a young design engineer at the time. He came up with this brilliant design of a twin-engine aircraft. You've got the pilot sitting in a little pod between the two aircraft, which made it a little bit chilly in the northern, in the sky, 30,000 feet, northern Europe in the middle of the winter time. That was a big disadvantage of this airplane. But in the Pacific Theater, when America finally entered the war in December 1941, in the Pacific Theater, this airplane really excelled. And by the end of the war, the P-38 Lightning it shot down and destroyed more enemy aircraft than any other airplane in the Army Air Force. For the Navy, it's this spectacular airplane above my head, your head, the Grumman F-6 Hellcat. The Hellcat destroyed over 5,000 enemy aircraft with a loss of only about 270. It's a 19 to 1 victories to loss ratio. I don't know if that's ever been duplicated by an aircraft. So for my Navy friends, there's your hero. My Air Force friends, I want to keep them separate. Don't want to have any fighting here. <laughs> this is the airplane. Now, the P-38 Lightning was the airplane flown by America's top two aces in the Second World War. Richard Bong from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, had 40 victories in the P-38, and Tommy McGuire had 38 victories in the 38. Tragically, neither one of those two heroes survived the end of the war. The um, airplane was the first American airplane capable of flying at 400 miles an hour. Um, in um, April of 1943, American intelligence picked up a message, intercepted a Japanese message, and we knew that within a couple of days, a particular admiral in the Imperial Navy named Admiral Yamamoto was going to be flying in the South Pacific. We knew his, his route. Admiral Yamamoto, if you don't know that name, was the architect of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. He was the Japanese admiral that devised the plan to attack Pearl Harbor, which started America in the Second World War. American intelligence intercepted that coded message, and a squadron of P-38s operating out of Guadalcanal, without radar, without GPS system, only using dead reckoning and a compass, intercepted that bomber, shot it down, and killed Yamamoto. Many, many people, me included, think that could have been the turning point of the war in the Pacific with the death of Yamamoto. He was a brilliant strategist. He told the emperor when he when when it was decision was made to attack Pearl Harbor, he said, I can only keep the Americans off for about six months. After that, when the American ingenuity and the American industrial complex gets moving, we cannot defeat them. Yamamoto had other plans in order to hit America so hard, and I'll explain that in a little while, that maybe we would negotiate peace terms. With his death, the rest of the Imperial Naval thought, no, we can beat America, and that was their failure. 
In the European air war, it was a deadly affair the first few years in the air war in, uh, in Europe. Bombers, American bombers were making daylight runs of, of occupied Europe starting in August of 1943 without fighter escort. And what I mean by fighter escort? Bombers, thousands of bombers are taking off. They're going to their target in Germany or occupied Europe. They're getting shot at by German fighters. They're getting shot at by cannon from the ground. And there's no American fighters protecting them. The P-38 couldn't go that far. The Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, the silver airplane right there, a great ground attack airplane, could not escort our bombers all the way to their target. We were losing 50, 60, 70 bombers a mission. Each bomber has a crew of 10. These are horrific losses. In the winter of 43-44, the air war in Europe took a turn in favor of the Allies with the introduction of this beautiful airplane right here, the North American P-51 Mustang hanging here, the red airplane. Obviously, this is not in military colors. This airplane was owned by an individual after the war, and he raced it. But that gives you an idea of the beautiful streamlined aircraft the engine that they put in it, they finally decided to use a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, and when they put that Merlin engine in this airplane, it was built by Packard here in the United States, this airplane was every bit as capable as anything the Germans had, and it had the range to escort our bombers all the way to occupied Europe and Germany and back. Now the bomber losses were much less. The bombing campaign could be intensified and by March of 1944, P-51s escorted bombers daylight bombing all the way to Berlin and back. Many Germans think that was the end of the war for the Germans when P-51s escorted bombers all the way to Berlin. Of course, the war dragged on for a whole other year. Dwight Eisenhower admitted after the successful invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944, he said it might not have been successful without air superiority. And by the time the P-51s were commanding the air, the P-38s and the P-47s could shoot up the Luftwaffe on the ground. They could destroy supply depots. They could supply, uh, destroy tanks. Air superiority was the key to the successful invasion of Normandy. That's the difference between air influence in the Second World War and absolutely no significance in the First World War. Good? Let's talk about the Enola Gay. <laughs>